all day yesterday and most of yet Friday just laying in bed. Uh, but through the Lord taught me some things. Um, and as I started to study out the idea of infirmity and try to preach on that, I saw that um, instead of moping in our infirmity, we're actually supposed to glory in it, believe it or not. Uh, when I am weak, the Bible says, then am I strong. Why? Because uh, the biggest infirmity that we have currently is our flesh. And that rotten, stinking, no good flesh is what bogs down our living, resurrected spirit each and every day. And because we have that flesh, we, we've, we feel pain, we feel anguish, we feel sorrow, we feel torment. And it causes us quite often to do things that we normally wouldn't. Why? Because the flesh always derives and desires pleasures that are unbecoming of Christians, that are actually sins. It, it uh, seeks to please only itself. It also, it also causes the moods of the soul, essentially, to be controlled by it. I found that yesterday, or on Friday there, when... When I'm at my workplace, I kind of said some snarky remarks I probably shouldn't have because my flesh wasn't feeling that good, and so someone rubbed me the wrong way, and next thing you know, I'm you know, <laughs> calling somebody a mouth breather or something like that. You know, just just wrong things. I'm going to have to apologize for it later, right? That, it gets the best of all of us. And, and, and honestly, the one thing that I did notice eventually um, was that Galatians 4.13 says this. It says, uh, you know how through infirmity of the flesh I preached the gospel unto you at first. And so the Apostle Paul was no stranger to suffering, no stranger to infirmity, and yet he says this to the Galatian church, I preached the gospel to you through much infirmity of the flesh. So you see quite often when your flesh is put down, when your flesh is weak, you become strong spiritually. The flesh no longer has dominion has reign over up over you and so i just went and played on that idea i think even as we go out soul winning i think often it's our flesh that gets in our way we don't want to be insulted we don't want to be offended we don't want to be hurt we're uncomfortable we're we're we're, we're out of our element when we go and we speak to strangers so i just kind of wanted to walk briefly in, in in the same vein as the apostle paul when he said through much infirmity i preach the gospel unto you I just wanted to walk through the typical Romans road and just kind of talk about some of the things that, that I will do in giving this very um, simple gospel presentation. See, if you've ever been soul winning with me, it's not always, it's not always the easiest. With, I, know, I know some people it's really easy to learn from because they'll often go out with the exact same gospel presentation each and every time. But if you've ever been soul winning with me, you know that I tend to shoot from the hip. I tend to be a little bit more spontaneous in my gospel presentation. So while I will use the same verses, I don't necessarily follow the same line of thinking. And I, I, I realize that, that both methods uh, work for certain situations. Um, being spontaneous has gotten me in trouble where I've just had to like, you know, admit my defeat or embarrassment and leave a door before, um, it's also benefited greatly. And I think the same thing happens to the people that are routinely. Um, maybe we should be a little bit more prone to both. So I just wanted to give a little bit of instruction so that we can, we can learn kind of together what the most simplest form of the gospel presentation would be. So turn to Romans chapter 3 and verse 10. And you can mark your Bibles if you want. I think most have been taught in this kind of fashion where you take basically your Bible, and you want to start with the first idea. And there's four different points that you need to learn about Jesus as you walk through the Romans road. You need to teach the person who you're preaching to that Jesus lived the life you could not live. You need to teach them that Jesus died the death that we all deserve. You need to teach them that Jesus is sufficient to save us, and we need to believe that. And then you need to teach them and even lead them, perhaps, to call upon him today. So like I said, I'm, I'm a little bit lacking in the first on teaching because I tend to go all over the place. So I'm just going to go through straightforward Romans road. Romans 3 verse 10 says, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. And what I do here in my Bible is I underline it is written and I underline none righteous. So the first point you want to bring to their attention is as it is written. This isn't what I'm saying. And, and obviously this is after the introduction, after you would say, you know, do you know for sure that you're on your way to heaven? And, and you've given the introduction, you've invited them to church, whatever. You say, more importantly, do you know you're on your way to heaven? 
And this is when you would get them into the gospel presentation. First you wanted them to know is that it's the Bible that's speaking now. It's not you, it's not the preacher, it's not, it's not some doctor, and it's not some uh, church, what they believe. It's the Bible that's going to speak to you now. And it says here, there is none righteous. So you need to know that there are, is nobody that is righteous. It's very clear, the Bible says, there is none righteous. And it doesn't give any wiggle room. It doesn't say there's some. So I've written in the margin of my Bible, go to 323. So if you go down to Romans 323, just in case people say, well, yeah, I'm not righteous, I'm not perfect, but I'm not as bad in such and such. Well, Romans 323 says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Some talking points here could be all. That, that, that idea that it's everybody. That's me, that's you. Uh, that, that's young, that's old. That's rich, that's poor. All have what they've sinned. I've underlined all and sin. Sin, the Bible is clear, is simply transgressing the law. You can talk to that point as well as you, as you walk through this. And you notice, as I go through this, I'm not pulling anything unusual out. I'm not, I'm not trying to find many different verses. I'm just using the clear teaching of what's in the Bible and just highlighting those words and explaining simply what they mean. That's all preaching is. It says, and come short of the glory of God. A good thing to do here is to give them that illustration where, where God is way up high. I can't even reach that high. And as I do good things, I might think that I'm getting closer and closer to God. But no matter how good I get, no matter how righteous I think I am, I am still coming short of the great glory of God. And this is simply what the Bible is teaching here. There is none righteous, and all have sinned. In my margin there, I would write, go to Revelation chapter 21 and verse 8. This isn't necessary for absolutely everybody, but it is good to bring it to perspective to those that might be doubting. Um, you know, I, I'm not that big of a sinner. Revelation 21 and verse 8 says, But the fearful and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters, and I have this underlined, and all liars. Usually what I'll do is right before I say the all liars is I'll stop and I'll say, those are all really bad sins, right? Those are all, I mean, I, I'm looking at you now and I don't see a sorcerer. I, I don't see somebody who's a murderer, but, though I don't know you very well. But look at this. It says, all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. All liars. Well, well that, that pretty much evens the playing field. The, who hasn't told a lie? Everyone's told a lie. And if you're going to now tell me you haven't told a lie, well, then I guess that's your first one. <laughs> the Bible is clear that all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, and that is the second death. That is the hell, fire, and brimstone that awaits those that have sinned. That's the righteous judgment of God. Go to Romans 6.23 is what I have written on the margin there. And in 6.23 you'll have this. For the wages of sin is death. So we just learned that all have sinned. We've just learned that all have come short of the glory of God. We've just learned that even liars have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Now we see that the wages of sin, in other words, what we're going to earn every time we sin, is death. And that's the bad news. Here's the contrasting verse. It says, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So we've just taught in that first portion there that, that Jesus essentially lived that life you couldn't live. So why do we see that? Well, you can add this point, that eternal life is through Jesus Christ our Lord. And just add that quick phrase from 1 John 3, 5. It says, in him is no sin. In other words, Christ didn't fall short of the glory of God. Christ did not sin. Christ was righteous. Christ did not tell that lie. And because of that, though your wages are sin, the gift that you can receive is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus lived that life that you could not live. That's plain from the scriptures. And in many, many, many other places, we can explain to you that because Christ is God in the flesh, he did not sin. He had no sin in him, the Bible says. And therefore, he could live that perfect life that you could not live. The next thing that I have is go to Romans chapter 5 and verse 6. It's just across the page in my Bible. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died 
for the ungodly. So just in the nick of time, Christ died for the ungodly. So this is why, though your wage is death, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. Why? Because he died for the ungodly. You were that ungodly one. You were that one without strength. And just in the nick of time, in due time, at that appointed time, Christ died for you. Well, why would he do such a thing? I have go down to 5 verse 8. You're just skipping a verse there. And it says, But God commendeth his love toward us in that, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And now this is a good time where you can start to reiterate some of the things you've already learned. Because you can go and say, now, we've already discussed the idea of sin, right? You understand that your lies sent you to the lake of fire. And they'll go, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. So you will admit that you're a sinner then. Yes, yes, I do. Okay, then, Christ died for you. This verse is clear. It says, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now, we know that everyone is sin, but the problem is many people will not admit that they're a sinner. But hey, since you're willing to admit that you're a sinner, hey, Christ died for you. Isn't that good news? Yeah, that's great news. It's excellent news, and it's actually how God proves his love. Go back to the beginning of that verse. It says, God commendeth his love toward us. Now that word commendeth simply means proves, and you can pen that in if you want. God proves his love toward us, and that he did that. He recognized you're a sinner. He recognized that now you're willing to admit that you're a sinner. And because of that, Christ died for you. I understand he died for the whole world. I understand he died 2,000 years ago. But now this gift can be received by you. There's just a few more things you got to learn. Christ died the death that we deserve to die. So at this point now, I will often go to John 3.16. Or what's easier is, is quite often you can simply quote it. Right? Most of us can quote John 3.16. I've, I've scarcely found somebody at the door that can't, can't quote John 3.16. It's pretty amazing. Yeah. People that grow up atheists or unbelievers or some other religion, quite often they can quote, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Amen. And so sometimes what helps is when you do have it before you, you can again highlight certain key words and you can just walk them through that. The greatest thing about John 3.16 is I believe that you can actually quote the fullness of the gospel through it, right? God loved the world, so he extended his love. It's just like we saw in Romans 5 verse 8. He extended his love. He proved his love that he gave his only begotten son. In other words, he gave the best of what he had. He gave himself even. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And we, so we see that keyword believeth, and we see that keyword everlasting life there. And we'll talk about those a little bit more as we go. So the reason why I sometimes I like to quote that is because usually I want to flip over pretty quickly to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 at this time. So I've written in my Bible at Romans 5 verse 8, I've said quote John 3.16, and then turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Because this is going to highlight that point of while you are yet sinners, Christ died for you. So 1 Corinthians 15 says, For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins. So this is accentuating it. There was the sinners that Christ died for. And now it's saying Christ died for our sins. Just making sure that both points of view of that are covered. According to the scriptures, again, bring that up. Hey, I just want to remind you, this isn't what I said. This isn't, this isn't what some preacher said. This isn't what some prophets. This is specifically what the scriptures are saying, the word of God. It says here, and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And that he was seen of Cephas and of the twelve. And I usually kind of carried on that. And I just kind of say seen of many, proving his, his resurrection. So the three points you'll see there is that the gospel that is being preached, the gospel that is being delivered is that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And you see those points accentuated and then you bring them to light that those events, those events in particular, were how Christ paid for our sins at this time, were what he did. So you can then say, okay, so now you understand that you're a sinner. You understand 
that because you admit that you're a sinner, that Christ died for you, then you understand that second point that Jesus died the death that we all deserved. And that's accentuated when it says he died for our sins. In other words, it was my sins that put him on that tree. It was my sins that had him buried. It was because of leaving my sins where he did that he rose again triumphant. So that seems all good. That seems all well. But what do I do with this information? How do I get saved is usually the question that I ask right now. Because we, you want to go to heaven. You want these truths to be applied to you. Turn now to Acts chapter 16. In Acts chapter 16, and I'll say, that's a very good question. What must I do to be saved? And it was actually asked in the Bible. In ver Acts 16, verse 30, it says, And brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved and thy house. And that brings to remembrance again, the idea of John 3.16, where it says, God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So the opposite of perishing, then, is here revealed as being saved. And it's simply through believing on him. The next point that you really want to accentuate, and you really want to highlight in all of this, is that believing is sufficient. Because there are many religious groups and there are many religious people out there that will say, I believe in Jesus, then I'm going to heaven. I, I believe in the figure Jesus. I believe in all of, all of the things that I've heard about him in Sunday school or whatever. But you need to accentuate that believing is sufficient. Believing is enough. And to do this, I want to focus on two points. First, that it's not of works. And second, that it's eternal. Because those are two different ways that the gospel is being tacked nowadays. Because they will add works to salvation. And they will also say that it is not eternal. In other words, you can believe on Jesus to be saved. Fine, well, good enough. But especially among Baptists, unfortunately, even. They're pushing that the works must go after to prove the salvation. Otherwise, you were not saved. Now, I believe that if somebody was saved at that point, then they are saved. But if someone is bogging down their mind with all of that, you must stay saved afterwards. That's simply the devil trying to cripple somebody that could be a good soul winner, that could be a great Christian. Just putting doubt and fears. And, and I believe that that can be said into a newborn babe in Christ's mind very, very soon after their salvation, whereby they spend the rest of their lives just doubting and wondering and thinking, well, well was I really? With? And, and, and you'll find all sorts that are just messed up on this. I've met many people that... that when I testify them at the door that it is, it is eternal, it's not of works, and they have this, you must have works afterwards, the more I go over, the more I realize they're saved, but they've been crippled by this, I need works afterwards, to the point where they're, they're, they're almost acting and believing like they're not even saved because they've been so messed up by that, by that corruption that's been mm. placed into their mind. It's a really sad state, so you need to reteach that person of eternal security. And it's more and more of a danger now. I, I remember um, this book, uh, Let's Go Soul Winning, and it was, it was by Jack Hiles. And he preached that, that the gospel presentation is essentially where I have left off. You get them to believe, and then you pray to them. Um, recently, Baptists have starting to, started to add the knot of works and the eternal right in after that in order to, to keep that straight. Um, Jack Hiles essentially taught that you would pray with the person and then try to firm them up on eternal security afterward. And I believe in his time that was valid because at his time and in his days, there wasn't so much of a push of, of false doctrine going on. I, I believe it, was, it worked. I believe that many got saved and you see the fruit of the ministry. But, but the problem is now with, with the internet and with false teachers and with uh, liars and wade and deceivers and, and all of the, the false doctrines that are creeping up, we need to be sure that before we go to pray with somebody that they are firmed up on not of works, and I believe all, especially not of works, because if they believe in any works before salvation, they're, they're not saved, absolutely. But the eternal aspect, we got to make sure that is firmed up in them. In other words, they're not going to think later on that they have to keep on doing works in order to stay saved. So what I normally do here is I will go to Ephesians 2. So from Acts 15, 16, 
We've affirmed that it's believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and that alone. I will go then to Acts, Ephesians, sorry, chapter 2. Ephesians 2 and verse 8. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Okay? So we will often quote that to them, and we will say, it's by grace through faith. And there's four different ways that it says it's not of works here. We're saved by grace, and it's through faith, which is believing, which is trusting. And it says, not of yourselves. In other words, it's not my effort. It's not your effort. It's God's effort. And then it says this in the next. It says, it is the gift of God. And then again, it's just going to highlight it and really drive this point home. Not of works, lest any man should boast. Four different ways it says very clearly that salvation has nothing to do with my efforts, my ways, my thinking, my doing. It is simply the gift of God that is received, and it's not of works. And then, because some people are like, well, then you can just do whatever you want. I like to also read verse 10 where it says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. This is a very important point because it says here that the workmanship, the work, is his alone. And we are created, in other words, that new birth is unto good works. In other words, the direction from where we're at is toward good works. We're not at good works now, maybe, but that's where we're headed. And we should walk in them. Here you can talk about the idea of chastening. Uh, give that illustration of a young child. I like to use a, a child out in the streets. You know, if my son was playing near the streets and I told him, this is the law, you do not cross this part of the sidewalk. Okay, that's, that's daddy's law, that's daddy's commandment. And Caleb was to get closer and get near that, th and he broke dad's law. I would grab a hold of him and I'd give him a little swat on the backside, right? Okay. Now, am I a mean daddy? Am I just so cruel? Why am I restricting? Why? No, I did that because I loved him. Because I know what's on the other side of that sidewalk is, is certain death. It's danger beyond what a little swat on the back, backside would do. But in order to teach him, I needed to correct him. In other words, I give him the law, I give him space to keep the law, and when he breaks it, I chasten him to bring him closer. In the same way, God will use laws to keep us on the straight and narrow, and when we break them, he will chasten us in a similar fashion. In this life, though we are saved forever. Why? Because it's not of our works that we are saved to begin with. And that is just a, a simple way of illustrating that idea of it being um, not of works. And make sure that point is clear. And obviously, in any one of these points, it's good to have two or three extra verses just to keep on hand. But again, I'm just following the simple uh, gospel Roman road. Go to now Romans chapter 6 and verse 23. We kind of bring this all full circle now. Because we have just taught them that Jesus lived the life, died the death, and that he is sufficient, and that believing on Christ is the only thing you need to be saved, and it's not of works. Amen. If you go to Romans 6.23, it says, For the wages of sin is death. You can reiterate that a little bit, right? You were on your way to what? Death. Well, what's another, the second death? You know, see if they got that point. Um, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ your Lord. And here that not of works and eternal come together. And you can use this verse to just teach those ideas both together. The gift. Well, what's a gift? Well, you can use simple illustrations. Like, if I was to give you, and whatever I have in my hand is usually sufficient, I was to say, here, I'm going to give this to you. And then I'll be like, give me five bucks. And they're like, that's not a gift. Okay, all right, all right. I'm going to give this to you. you got to wash my truck. That's not a gift. I worked for it. Okay, you can use simple illustrations like that. And be like, well, how about this? I'm going to give this to you. I walk away. You don't see me for 20 years. And then I come back and say, hey, I need that back. That wasn't a gift either. What do you, what do you mean? That, you, you took it back. Exactly. Okay. In that same way, the gift of God is given freely to you. There's no strings attached, right? Yeah, yeah, I get that. Now, what does this word eternal mean? That means that in 20 years, God's not going to come and take it back. Otherwise, was it a gift? No, it wasn't. 
What about in a hundred years? What about in a thousand? What about in a, a million years? No, it's eternal. It lasts forever. Okay, right. And you can highlight that point that it's eternal. Even show them John three sixteen again. Right? There's eternal, everlasting. It's all there. It doesn't end. It lasts forever. By this point, there a lot of things are clicking. A lot of things are spinning. The spirit's been speaking to their heart for a while, and and most people at this point have a clear understanding of the gospel and what it means. Now here is when we transition to them actually receiving the gift of eternal life. We've taught them that Christ lived the life. We've taught them that Jesus died the death. And we've taught them that he is all sufficient. It's not a work. It's eternal. It does not end. Romans chapter 10 is where we begin to get them to transition to actually receiving that gift. And this is actually a hard point for a lot of people. I don't know if you've ever been out there and you've gotten people to completely understand the gospel, and a lot of people are just not willing to take the step to actually receive the gospel. I had, I had four, uh, three Sikhs in front of me, Hindus in front of me, and after I sold our bed frame to the guy, and, and his friends listened to the gospel the entirety, and they understood it. They're like, this sounds great, this is awesome. But ultimately, they would not perform step four, which is to call upon the name of the Lord. They wouldn't receive them. Why? Because they say, well, that's just not what we were taught. This is not how we were raised. This is not how we were brought up. This is what we believe. And I'm like, but you guys believe what I'm saying. You've understood it. You get it. They're like, yeah, but we, we, not right now. Basically, their, their family, their religious, their past bondage, whatever kind of pressures that they have, they just were not willing to accept that. Now, I have a feeling that if I had maybe one or two of them aside or whatever, I might have gotten one of them. I think when there's when there's three together, they kind of man up. No one wants to be in, embarrassed to be the first to do it or something. I don't know how it was, but regardless, this is always a difficult step to transition them from understanding, from believing the truth to actually receiving it. Romans chapter 10 and verse 9 says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So there's, the, there's usually the rub is that first part, thou shalt confess with thy mouth. If you looked in John chapter 1 and verse 20, confess just simply means deny not. In other words, you're going to vocally admit that with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead thou shalt be saved. And here's actually the mechanism or the mechanics of how it works. It says, for with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. In other words, the person is not ashamed of the truth that they've just heard. They believe it, they will not deny it, and they are going to vocalize that um, without reserve. Amen. And then I'll go up to verse 13. It just says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And this is where I simply will ask, well, have you prayed before? Do you know how to? And I'll usually give people the option, because it's a, it's, a, it's a sweet thing, I'll tell you, when somebody calls upon the name of the Lord all by themselves. It's a great thing. So I'll give them that option, and usually, quite often, people are, like, nervous, or they've never prayed before, and they don't understand. So I'll explain prayer, you know. Just like we're talking right now, you just simply talk to the Lord. You don't, you don't need to have a certain pose, posture. You don't need to have a certain time of day. There's nothing ritualistic about it. You just talk to God like I'm talking to you right now. But anyways, a lot of people aren't comfortable doing that for the first time. So how about, since the words aren't magical, there's nothing to the words, you can, I can just give you some words to say and help you along the way. And you can just repeat after me. And most people are, are comfortable at that point. A lot of their apprehensions have, have fallen and, and they'll certainly call upon the name of the Lord. A prayer can be as simple as, Dear Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I understand the truths that I've heard today, and I know that if I believe on you, you'll take my sins away and take me to heaven. Uh, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom, was one of the prayers of the thief on the cross. You know, there, there's so many different ways that some people can call upon them, but usually what I want to do is kind of iterate the gospel truths to them and just bring them to remembrance. So then as they're saying them, and I remind them, don't pray to me, you're praying to God, right? I remind them of what they've just heard and then have them openly confess it before God. And that's simply the gospel presentation. The hard parts really are the first and, and the last. It's, it's hard to get the introduction and to get somebody into the spiritual mindset to talk. And it's kind of hard to, like, at the end, be like, you know, um, 
Well, have a nice day. Usually what I'll try to do is give them a church invite, teach them a little bit of doctrine if I have some time. Because some people are really willing to keep on listening. So you can give them a little bit of doctrinal truths and try to get a King James Bible in their hand is important. But again, I just wanted to highlight a, a, a simple Roman road to come with some of the ideas that kind of I use as I'm walking through. And I hope that helped. Some uh, <clears throat> final points I'd just like to add is um, when you're using dialogue uh, or explanation, we really want to rely on the Word of God. So that's why it's good to have your Bible with you. But if you've been sewing with me also, you notice that I don't always use it. I'll sometimes keep my Bible tucked under my elbow, elbow for, for other reasons. And I'll usually just walk through a track like this. Brother Rob made these, and I think they're great. And uh, I'll usually just explain to someone, look, I can flip through the Bible and show you, but it's just as easy if I just use this track because I'm going to leave this track with them when I go. I'm not going to necessarily leave my Bible with them when I go. So at least it'll be something that'll be uh, a picture in their mind's eye. They can look at these same verses and remember kind of what they've been through. And it just helps it for clarity's sake, right? Because, oh, here's all the verses and here's all the understanding and it's all right here for you. Um, but like I said, you need to rely on the word. And so what I'll often do is even with a pen is, is I'll say, you know, even though some of these are highlighted, I'll say, I'll have sin. I'll say, you see that word sin? And I'll just highlight certain points. Using the Bible, I'm explaining with my own words what the Bible said. Not just bringing in my own words and my own opinions, my own ideas to kind of explain it. But I think it's important we really just rely upon the Word. Because it is the Word that saves. It's, it's quick. It's powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It, it's, it's the incorruptible seed that we're born again by. So we don't need to have too much of our own explanation to it. Just simply highlighting and accentuating what the Bible already says is, is more than sufficient. Uh, the next point is don't get sidetracked. I think a lot of us um, often worry, and I know I did. I, I thought I didn't have all of the answers. And so when I went to the door, I would kind of be stumbled upon because some really smart atheist was going to come to me with some sort of evolution idea, and I wouldn't be able to answer him about some fossil. And I was just like, i got to have all of the answers before I can ever go to a door and, and preach to somebody. Best thing you can do when somebody does that is, is look, you have, you have in your Bible a roadmap. You, you're going to this, and you're going to that, and you're going to this. And you can just simply say, um, that's a really good question. Now, if you don't mind, can we get to that after? I just want to continue showing how you can go to heaven. Remember, that's the reason why I'm here. Remember, that was the most important thing. Oh, yeah, yeah, I remember that. And you can just kind of remind them that, hey, you know, we, we did come inviting you to church, and, and, and we could sit here and talk about dinosaurs, but really, remember the most important thing was, was knowing we're on our way to heaven. And just get back on track. Just get back on, and, and give them the option to talk about those things later. And quite often, the questions that came to their mind were just some sort of distraction from, from the spiritual realm. They, they were just trying to sidetrack the conversation anyways. And honestly, um, they've never asked the question again at the end. And if they do, just, just be like, oh, I'll get back to you. Write me an email, and I'll, I'll, I'll come back to you with that one. I don't know yet. <clears throat> So don't, don't, don't get sidetracked. Just politely get back on topic. And don't debate. That's one of the worst things we can do at the door is to just go back and forth in a debate. Um, honestly, if, if somebody is really stuck on one thing and, and you do manage to give them a Bible and a second Bible, and you can just ask me, like, look, do you want to hear what the Bible says about salvation? Because if not, I'm just going to carry on politely, right? Best you can. There's no reason to get involved in a debate. I've yet to be at a door and back and forth in a debate and have it work itself back into the world of salvation. I've done the I've done the pull back from being sidetracked two or three times and had to do that and then eventually get them to a salvation. But debates to me have never ended up on the right side of things. I just get angry, they get angry, and next thing you know, nothing spiritual is coming out of it. And the third point is is don't fear, walk with God. You're going armed with the Word of God. And we don't need to fear, we don't need to doubt, we don't need to be concerned with how men are going to receive the truths that we're about to present. We just need to go knowing, first of all, God commanded us to. And so just by going out into those doors, you are being obedient. And therefore, that's the victory. That, that's, that's the best possible thing you can do is to just be obedient unto God. Whether you get zero souls or a hundred souls saved, the same outcome is obedience to God, and you will be rewarded accordingly. Don't fear, and don't let fear bog you down. Fear 
is just going to cripple you. It's going to make you weak as a soul winner. You need to stand on the promises of God and let Him carry you through that situation just as well as every situation that life throws at you. So with that, I think I'm just going to uh, pray us out, and then we'll take a little bit of a break.